Hey, hello, good morning. Uh, I guess it's time to get started. Um, so before I get started with the, the talk, how many people have already written some device fragments? Yeah, quite a few, maybe like a third of the room. Okay. Not successfully. Not successfully, okay. <laughs> So in, in this talk at the title suggest I'm going to try to go from the basics and introduce what is the device tree, what's the main idea behind that, and um, help you understand the syntax of the device tree and hopefully a little bit the spirit of the device tree. Uh, as a disclaimer, I'm by far not a device tree guru. Uh, all, all the talk is based on what I've learned uh, in the field uh, doing some uh, ARM development. So obviously it's all ARM stuff. It's not, it should have been in the subtitle probably, but it's all ARM related. I don't know how the device tree is used on other architectures, but at the moment, I guess it's most of the crowd is probably going to be interested in ARM uh, specific things. Um, so it's, it's really, I'm really not a device tree guru. I will try not to make too many inaccuracies, but there might be some. I will just try to share how I see the device tree um, today. Uh, just a few words, I'm Thomas, I work for Free Elections, we do training and development and um, the re reason why I have I gained some device tree experience over, over the last year and a half is because we've been involved in mainlining the support for the Armada 370 and Armada XP uh, SOCs for Marvel. So those SOCs are used in, uh, mainly in NAS devices and we've pushed the, the support for those SOC uh, into the mainline kernel and it's, it was all based on device tree from day zero. So we've done a lot of uh, device related work uh, around that. And I also happen to, to work on, on Build Boot as a side project. So today, I first want to start with the user perspective. So not the, the kernel developer, but the, the user. What the device tree is changing in terms of how you boot the kernel. So it's gonna be a fairly short uh, section. Then goes through the basic device tree syntax. Um, see a simple example of a device tree. Then the overall organization. So after looking at the very simple fragment, look. Overall, what's the organization of the different nodes and, and sub-nodes that we have in the device tree? And then we'll go through uh, different examples of device tree and we'll uh, talk about different bindings. Uh, I'll mention like clocks and pin control and, and interrupts and things like that, just to give you a feeling of um, how the device tree is being used today and then I'll end up with some general consideration about device tree bindings design. So before the device tree, when you wanted to um, used a kernel on ARM, uh, the kernel was uh, completely containing the entire description of the hardware in, in terms of uh, C-based structures, describing all the platform devices, the I2C devices, the SPI devices. So the kernel was, I would say, self-sufficient. Uh, you had a single binary, you image the image, whatever image type you're using, uh, your, your bootloader puts that into memory, starts it, and before starting it, it gives it a, a few information, uh, the machine number in register R1 and uh, an attack set of information, so it's kind of a data structure that the bootloader uh, builds uh, with uh, information such as the memory location and size, the kernel command line, and a bunch of other things, and passes that to the kernel, which finds it at some uh, location passed in R2, parses that, but the, most of the, if not all, of the hardware description was inside the kernel itself. So it's pretty much what you add. Uh, you image, just the attacks information passed by the bootloader, and, and that's it. So what the device tree changes is that the description of the hardware moves into a separate um, binary blob. Uh, that's a, a new file, an additional file next to your kernel image. So in, in addition to your U image or Z image, you have one of those files that ends with a DTB extension, which is the binary compiled version of the device tree describing um, the hardware platform. And the bootloader will actually load two things into memory. On one side, the kernel image, as it's used to do, and also the binary blob. And will pass the address of this binary blob to the kernel, which will parse it to find out what's the hardware available on this particular platform. So it replaces the machine type idea. It no longer exists, and the kernel is really bases all its hardware discovery um, uh, strategy on, on the device tree. So that's, that's the change on, on the user perspective. So yeah, in, basically instead of attacks that were limited to describing a very limited set of information, we now have a much more complicated data structure with a lot more information and that, being, that is being passed by the, to the kernel. Um, so that's nice, but it requires um, a device tree capability at the bootloader level. As you've noticed here below, I've mentioned how to boot a device tree uh, capable uh, kernel uh, from the bootloader, both from uBoot and, and Burbox. 
So the bootloader needs to be aware of that, you need to be aware of this change in the protocol between the bootloader and the kernel. And, and it happens that not all bootloaders that are available today on, on, on platforms, on existing platforms, do support that. So yes, Uboot and Burbox in their mainline version do support that, but as most of you probably know, uh, many of the platforms around have some uh, crazy vendor bootloaders that have been uh, uh, written years ago and, and they, they are not going to change really soon. In, for some vendors, it's in the process of being done. For others, it's already done. But you don't necessarily have a device tree capable bootloader. So for, to solve this problem, the kernel developers have added a compatibility mode, which is called the appended DTB. And the idea is that to uh, make the, is to make the bootloader believe that there, there is still only one single kernel image file to load into memory. But in fact, this kernel image is actually the kernel image itself to which you append the DTB, which is the binary version of the device tree. And the way you do that is just with CAD or whatever tool you, you like to do this. And then you give your bootloader this thing. It doesn't know it as a device tree. But since you've built the kernel with this configuration option, uh, config arm dependent DTB, the kernel will look after the kernel image find that there is a DTB and use that as the hardware description. And from that point on, it's exactly similar as if you had um, a device tree capable bootloader. There is also an additional option, um, ATAG DTB Compat, which uh, tells the kernel, read the ATAG's information that are passed by the bootloader. So normally if your bootloader is DT capable, no longer ATAGs. But since your bootloader is in that case no, not DT capable, it's still passing some ATAGs, including the kernel command line and the memory location and size. And the kernel is capa capable of reading out those information and patching the device tree. So that from the kernel point of view, it's just as if the bootloader was device tree capable. So that's the idea from the uh, user perspective. That's the change. Now, what what's exactly is the device tree? So to help me uh, introduce the device tree, I just copy-pasted a bunch of um, fragments from the um, standard for embedded poor architecture platform requirements, which is actually the, the I guess, the formal document that describes what is the device tree, the syntax, and, it, and its meaning. I found it quite hard to read uh, originally. Uh, I guess it takes a little bit of experience with the device tree to actually understand what this document is, is saying. Uh, but when you read it again and again and again, it starts to make sense after a while. <laughs> so what, what this document specifies is the concept um, called the device tree, which describes the system hardware. A boot program, as I was saying, loads that into uh, the memory and passes that to the client, which in our case is Linux. And this client is going to use that to know what's the hardware available. So a device tree is a tree data structure, as the name suggests, with nodes that describe different elements in your uh, system. And it's actually being used to describe the hardware that cannot be dynamically detected. So we are typically not going to describe USB devices or PCI devices in a device tree because you have mechanisms to enumerate them dynamically. Uh, but we're going to describe all those platform devices, uh, I2C, SPI, and those that are not dynamically discoverable. The basic syntax is actually, I would say, quite simple, but maybe it's just because I became used to it. Uh, so it's a tree of nodes. Um, each node has a name, uh, which is here, and a unit address, which uh, is typically used to, um, well, uniquely identify different nodes having the, the, the same name, and it's normally used for the memory address at which the, this device um, is, is mapped for memory map devices. And then each node can have a number of properties and can have a number of subnodes. And so the, the device tree, um, Syntax does not impose any specific name for the properties, any specific value. It's just a very, um, well, simple language. And you can use whatever property name you want, whatever node name you want, how many sub-nodes you want, and, and so on. So the language is actually pretty, pretty simple. Each property can have uh, different types of values. There are integer values. There are Boolean properties. There are uh, string properties. There are also properties that point to another node. That's what we call a p-handle in the device tree language. So actually, a device can reference another device. And we're going to see a practical example of that. Uh, you can have child nodes to describe things that you are managing. So one typical example is you have an I2C controller. And then this I2C controller allows you to access an I2C bus. And the devices that sit on that bus are going to be child nodes of the I2C controller node. And I'm going to show such an example. 
Uh, some nodes can have uh, labels, and labels are um, the, the name that's used for p-handle. So it's a, a shortcut for um, um, pointing to, to a specific node. So basically, the, the, the syntax of the device tree itself is, I would say, pretty simple. The complexity comes from giving it a meaning. Um, how do you go from this um, source representation to uh, binary? So on ARM, all the device tree source files at the moment are located in arch ARM boot DTS. So this file is, uh, this directory, sorry, is growing in size quite quickly. I've, I made a graph that I could have included, but it's, it's really growing like, like crazy uh, due to the number of platforms being converted. And we basically have um, two, two files with two different extensions in there. We have DTSI files, where DTSI means, stands for includes. Um, and final DTS files. So the final DTS files are usually the one that describes board level information and that are the one compiled into DTBs. And they generally include one or several DTS signs that describe uh, information from the SOC or that are shared between multiple boards. So the idea is that instead of duplicating information, if you have one SOC used by 20 boards, all the SOC level information is stored in the DTSI, which can to be included in several DTS files. Then we have a tool, the device tree compiler, or DTC, that is located in scripts DTC, uh, that is used to take a DTS file and then resolve all the included files and, and, and turn that into a, a, a packed binary format that your bootloader and the kernel can actually understand. And what it produces is the DTB, or device tree blob, that is actually what gets manipulated again by the, the bootloader on, on your kernel. And you don't usually have to worry about building the DTB yourself because in this very directory, ArchArm boot DTS, there is a make file which tells for each platform, so for each ARM sub-architecture, in, in that the case here, it's the Marvel platform I've been working on, uh, which lists all the DTBs that should be built. So generally you have a list, sometimes quite a huge list, of all the boards that are part of this platform. And so whenever you're going to build the kernel for this platform, it's going to build all the DTBs for all those boards. And it will be your job to select the correct DTB and, and put that into your bootloader and, and start your system. So now a simple real example of uh, one node of a device tree. So I've taken one from the IMX28 DTSI. So it's SOC level information. And uh, here we have a bunch of things. So we have a label, AUR0, and then the, the node name, it's, it's serial at some address, and the address, the unit address here, um, just for well clarity, uh, is the same as the address where the, the registers of this device are available into memory. But it's it actually doesn't, it's not very important. This part here, you could have used zero, one, for twenty-four, or anything. Uh, what's really important is what we have in this property. The first property, compatible, is uh, probably the most important one and the most complex one to understand. So I'm going to. Uh, talk several times about it over this uh, presentation. Uh, what the uh, EPAPR says is that it defines the programming model for the device. Well, what's that means? So basically it allows the operating system to identify which driver um, should be responsible for driving this device. So there will be a direct match between, a direct connection between the compatible string being chosen and the driver that is going to be bound to this um, very device. Then we have the reg property, um, which gives the, for memory mapped um, devices where it's available in memory. We have the interrupt number. We can have potentially several of them. Uh, here we have uh, references to DMA channels. And that's interesting because, as you can see, we have this property here as a, a list of two values. And those values are p-handles, so they are pointing to some other node, which actually is going to be the DMA engine on this platform. And in addition, it's, it's kind of passing an argument to this p-handle in, in some ways. So it's saying, yeah, OK, for, for DMA, I'm going to use DMA engine 8. OK, I don't know what that means exactly at the moment, and DMA engine 9. And in fact, it's, it's going to um, be used by the DMA engine API to know which DMA channel this specific um, hardware block is going to use. So it's going to be using 8 or 9. And to make lookup easier in the driver, it's also associating names to each entry in this list. So it's 
saying Rx is this one and Tx is this one. So I know it's not necessarily, um, well, explicit, but that's the way it works. Um, and this allows the, the, the kernel APIs to uh, allow you in the driver to say something like, I want to get the Rx DMA channel. And it's going to find out, yeah, okay, Rx is the first one in the list, so it's going to be this one, and I'm going to give you a reference to this DMA channel. So it's a bit, a bit weird, but that's the way it works. Um, here we have more or less the same thing, but we have only uh, one element. And it's uh, just saying, okay, the clock for this device is part of this other node, and the argument I'm passing is 45. That's a way of identifying this clock. And in this um, uh, DTSI file, we're, we're saying this device is disabled. When status is disabled for a platform device, it tells the kernel not to probe that device. And the reason is that in DTSI, DTSI files, usually you describe all the internal SOC devices, but not necessarily all of them are used on a specific board. So in the DTS file for a specific board, you're going to say, this device, I'm going to enable it so that it gets probed, but if some other, like UART, is not wired on your specific board, you're probably going to leave it disabled because there's no point in, in probing a device that's not being used. Um, on the driver side for this uh, thing, um, the driver now needs to say which um, devices it is capable of supporting, and again, that's done using this compatible string mechanism. So a bit like um, in, in the old world, uh, the platform devices had a name, which was used to match with the name of the driver, and when they matched, the probe function of the platform driver was called. Here it's when the compatible string is matching with the list of IDs that's inside the driver that the uh, driver probe function is going to be called. So whenever you have a platform driver function, with the old style, we were using this driver name, so it had to match between platform device and platform driver. And now we have an OF match table, which points here to a list of um, tuples that give a compatible string and some private data. And so when the kernel is going to go through the device tree, find all the devices, find which driver matches, call your prop function if it matches, it, it will find, yeah, there is a match, and it will also allow you to retrieve this private data. So this specific driver, for example, um, supports two variants of this UART. So it supports two compatible strings, but it has two different private data so that the driver can adapt to the small differences between those two variations of the hardware block. Does that make sense? Yeah. And in the prop function, which is here, the driver can actually fetch that private uh, data by using the OF match device function. So basically, it's going to redo the matching for the platform device against the, the, type, the table and give you a, a pointer to which entry has actually matched this device. So you can retrieve the private data and then your driver can act differently depending on, on the data that, that's available. So a sim, single driver can handle as many compatible strings as you want and it allows the driver to hide small differences or larger differences between variations of the same or a similar hardware block. That's, that's the idea. Of course, if the, the, those differences are too important, then maybe you need two, two different drivers. That's the usual, the usual thing. It doesn't change anything here. But the single driver can expose uh, and, and handle multiple compatible strings and act a little bit differently depending on the compatible string that's being passed. Um, on the C code point of view, uh, there isn't much change uh, compared to normal uh, platform devices because all of the APIs that were used, or most of the APIs that were used by uh, platform drivers to retrieve resources, clocks, in, uh, RQs, um, uh, memory mapped um, regions, or DMA channels, or anything like that, all those APIs have gained a device tree support, so they are automatically going to do the right thing. So, for example, you were doing platform get RQ in your driver, and in the old world, it was going into your uh, platform device, then resources, and, and finding the, the RQ resource. Now it's finding the interrupts property in the device tree and, and providing that to you transparently. Uh, same thing for um, platform get resource, for the uh, memory resource, same thing for the clock. Uh, same thing for the DMA channels, and here you see we have the, those names, Rx and Tx, and they will automatically be mapped to the right entry in the, the, the list of DMA channels for that device. 
But of course, there are some additional properties that you may add in your um, um, device tree uh, that describe more precisely how the device is connected in your system or give some more specific information. So there is an, an, a device tree specific API, which usually is prefixed by OF. And one example in this driver is that it supports uh, an additional property called UART as RTS CTS, which allows you to tell whether this UART as RTS CTS connected or not. So that's a board specific information that you can add in this node here, but not in the DTSI file because that's SOC level. So you would most likely add that in the DTS file, which describes the board. And the driver um, gets to know whether this property is set or not by calling OF get property. And there is a lot of other things you can do with OF functions like go through child nodes and there's a whole bunch of API functions that you can, you can use. They are usually quite, quite simple. Um, so as I was saying until now, there is a mechanism that allows you to include um, device trees into other device trees. Um, so DTSI files are included files and DTS files are final device trees. And as I was saying, usually DTSI contain SOC level information and DTS files contain board level information. But the inclusion is interesting and I think it's, it's one of the, probably the strongest point of the device tree in my opinion, is that the inclusion works by actually overlaying the different trees on top of each other. So a DTSI file can set a property and it can be overridden by a DTS file that is including that DTSI. So I'm going to take an example here, and that actually comes from the kernel. So the kernel has an AM33XX DTSI file to describe this TI SOC. So there's a bunch of nodes, and I've taken again the UART example. And then there is one DTS file for the, the beagle bone. In that case, it's a, the white beagle bone, the original one. And as you can see there, uh, the, the, the hierarchy of the nodes is exactly the same. And it, it will actually put the second tree overlaid on top of the first one. So if there is a new property here, which is the case for the pin control names and pin control zero properties, it's going to add them. And if a property is present in, on bus, which is the case for status here, of course the including one is going to um, override the included one. So at the end, the real DTB that the kernel is going to see is that one. So of course the DTB is compiled, it's kind of the virtual textual representation of that DTB but it's going to have the, the, the union of those properties with those one taking precedence over those ones if they are both present. And this works on several levels. So for example, on, on um, the SOCs I've worked on, uh, we have a family of SOCs. They have m many things in common, but some things different. So instead of having just one DTSI and per SOC and then DTS files for the boards, we have a tree of DTSI files. Uh, where, we, where we have all the common things for all uh, the SOCs in this DTSI and then progressively you re refine the description of the hardware all the way to the board. So this is maybe going to add, okay, this one is a four core variant, it has four gigabit interfaces and, and, and 10 PCI Express interfaces, for example. This one is only a dual core with, uh, I don't know, maybe two or three Ethernet interfaces. The device tree is, is describing progressively all those details all the way to the board, which is going to describe how things are wired and the additional uh, elements on the board. So that's, I believe it's really the, the strong point um, describing the, 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 the hardware progressively with properties overlaying uh, properties from the included um, device tree file. Uh, now there is the concept of the binding. Um, basically, the binding is how to make sense out of the properties. As I was saying, the device tree is just a language. You can keep write uh, whatever property you want, like foobar equal blah blah, and it's just going to compile fine. There is absolutely no, at the moment, no tool, no mechanism to check whether the property you're using actually makes sense and exists. So you can write whatever you want in the device tree. But of course, to make it, it useful, um, you have to make sense out of a set of properties, names, property values, compatible strings, and so on. And that's what we call bindings. So a binding is essentially um, a specification that says, uh, if you want to describe, um, I don't know, such or such Ethernet interface, you have to use this compatible string, add this uh, property with this value, um, and these are the possible values, add this other property with these other values, and so on and so on. So it's actually, a binding is actually a specification. It's not, it's not code. 
Of course, then it has to be implemented in one or several drivers that may follow the same binding. Um, so it has an implementation, but the binding is really a specification. Um, so as the EPAPR says, uh, bindings are how specific types and classes of devices are represented in a device tree. And the compatible string is the key to identify which binding applies to a given node in the device tree. That's uh, how it works. Uh, and a binding should uh, be designed to be able to allow the description of all the necessary hardware details that a driver will need to actually use, make use of that device and connect it with the other devices around if, if needed. So the core part of the device tree bindings is actually documentation, as I was saying, and they are documented in documentation, device tree bindings, and there is a bunch of a growing set of files in there. It's a bit messy, the organization in there, but it's, well, you can find your way. Grep is your friend. And um, basically, whenever you add a new driver that introduces a binding in the kernel, you are required to write such a documentation. Usually, it's pretty simple because for most devices, it's quite simple. For some other cases, it gets really, really crazy because the bindings are very complicated, so you have, and you have the entire range all between. Um, nowadays, all the new device tree bindings must be reviewed by the device tree maintainers, so there is a dedicated mailing list, so if you're interested in, in device tree discussions and, and, and a very, very lengthy discussion on how to best represent some hardware in the DT and you like to read hundreds of emails, just subscribe to that mailing list. There's the team of maintainers that are supposed to review the bindings and, 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 and act them when they are appropriate or give feedback. Uh, this process is not working really, really well at the moment because um, there are so much development going on on ARM that the device tree maintainers are completely overflowed by bindings to review and it's, it's too slow. Uh, so there are ongoing discussion on how to make that process um, go better. There were discussions yesterday in the ARM kernel mini summit. And I think they are going to like relax a little bit the rules here and, and give a bit more freedom to people so that development can go on. But up to now, the idea was that, yeah, a binding is something that, and we're, I'm going to mention that later, that is designed once and should stay forever, uh, which is a very, very hard and, st and strict rule and very difficult to, um, uh, to work with. So apparently they are going to relax that a little bit. But usually when you, yeah, when you design a binding, it should be a little bit future-proof and, and allow for, um, to, to, to exist for a while. So here is an example of a device tree binding documentation. Uh, I took the one of the, 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 the example I, I used before. Um, so basically what it says is, well, for what type of device it is, then what are the required on or optional properties. So here it says, yeah, you need to have a compatible property, you need to have a write property, you have to have an interrupts property, a DNA property, and so on. And for example, it forgets clocks, because <laughs> clocks is a property that basically you can use in whatever um, device you want, but it should probably mention it. Um, so the documentation is not completely accurate here. Um, and then usually gives an example and any other information that's can be, uh, that can be useful. So that's what we, we have and that's what um, device tree binding maintainers typically review. That's what's important. Then if the implementation is somewhat broken, we can fix, fix it later, but the binding is normally um, uh, an interface that is not supposed to change, so we have to be a little bit careful on how it's designed. Now that we've looked at one single node, let's try to have an overall look at the, the, the device tree in its en entirety. Um, at the root of the device tree, so which is supposed to describe the entire um, hardware platform, we have a bunch of um, nodes that are either mandatory or optional, but that are uh, described in the um, um, EPAPR uh, specification. And then you can add more nodes, uh, and actually the, the more nodes that uh, you're going to add are the, are the most important ones. So amongst the, the, the ones specified in the uh, specification are the CPUs, memory, chosen analysis node, and there are a bunch of others, but those ones are the, the, main, the most, most common ones. So the CPU nodes is uh, going to have sub-nodes describing each CPU in the system, like whether you have a Cortex-A8 or Cortex-A9 or some other thing, and, and sometimes some additional properties of each CPU. The memory node is mainly used to uh, define where the memory is located, the physical memory, and what, what its size is. Uh, the chosen node is, according to the specification, a place 
where uh, parameters chosen uh, or defined by the system firmware at boot time can be stored. At the moment, it's mainly used to pass the kernel command line. So if the bootloader is device tree capable, it's, good, it's gonna take your device tree blob and it's going to patch it, or I would say update it, by inserting your kernel command line into the DTB and the kernel will find it at this place. Then we have an aliases uh, node which contains shortcuts to certain nodes that are needed for some specific binding, bindings. I don't want to really dive into the, the details here. And then the most important um, sections are going to be the description of the buses in the SOC and the onboard devices. So I've taken the example of the IMX28 platform again. And uh, as you can see, we have the root of the tree here. Then we have those um, um, common nodes uh, specified by the uh, EPAPR specification. And then we have sub-nodes, uh, other sub-nodes here describing various buses on this platform. So depending on how your SOC is organized and how the interconnects are uh, connected together, which device sits on which bus, you can have as many uh, nodes as you want, sub-nodes, if those buses are, uh, are like sub-buses. On some other platforms, it's much simpler than that. You just have one single uh, top-level node like called SOC, and you have all the pl platform devices in there. It all depends. It's, it's left to the, the, uh, the freedom of, is left to the, uh, the person like designing the, the description uh, of this particular platform. So here it matches the hardware. Um, so without going into the details, uh, it has like two, I would say like more or less slow bus and one high speed bus. The high speed bus AHB is here and has like the memory and so Ethernet, that kind of things. And then the APBH and APBX are other buses that are like slower speed devices. So that's just the way the SOC is, is organized, but they model that into the device tree as we can see here. And so within those nodes, uh, there are going to be all the devices that you see over here. So in AHB, we're gonna have, for example, the Ethernet devices. And then in um, APBH, we're going to have, I don't know, the intro controller, for example, and then, and then the SSP0, SSP1, and so on and so on. So it's really, as I, I try to ensure that you could see the direct connection between the, the schematics, the, well, the block diagram, and, and the device tree representation here. And then the, the at the board level, in the DTS file, basically since it's overlaid, we have the same organization. And so we can add more information about which UR we want to enable, which SSP device we want to enable, and, and so on and so on. And we can also add more nodes that describe board level information, such as sound complex or LEDs or backlight information, that kind of things. So that's the overall organization. And of course, depending on the SOC family you're using, the, the hierarchy of buses is gonna be different, so the exact hierarchy is gonna be slightly uh, different. But the idea is always usually the same. Uh, one thing that's important here is the top level compatible string. So just like you have compatible strings in, in nodes identifying devices, you have one at the top of the device tree that's actually going to identify the platform. And here, as you can see, we have um, two compatible strings and you can actually give as many compatible strings as you want. And they should be given from the most, most precise first to the least precise last. Uh, so that the matching is done by trying to match first uh, finding the, the driver or the, the kernel element responsible for driving this element of the device tree that is the most specific possible. So here we're having uh, one compatible string that identifies the board. It's the evaluation board for the IMX28, so that's IMX28 EVK. And then this platform is also compatible with IMX28 because it has this SOC. And this top level um, compatible property is the one that is going to be used to uh, find which uh, sub-architecture you're actually running. So in the past, we had these machine start, uh, machine end section that were identifying each board. Nowadays, we have DT machine start um, structures that basically have more or less the same thing. But what they have in addition is a DT compat field, which points to a list of compatible string that this platform is supporting. So with the um, advent of multi-platform kernels, you can have within the same kernel image, the support for OMAP SOC, for Marvel SOCs, for Freescale SOCs. And of course, it's, it's going to have to decide which platform is, going to be, is, is being booted at the moment. And the way it does that is it looks at this top level compatible string, finds which machine uh, description uh, structure has this compatible string, 
And if there is a match, then it's going to use all the other hooks that are inside this structure to like start the timer, the interrupt controller, and, and register all the devices. Then it, it's exactly as it was before. But that's the way the, the connection is made. Uh, this compatible string can also be used uh, within uh, C code uh, to test if the machine is um, the one you're interested in to do like some, some quirks and, and different um, changes that may be needed. Uh, for example, it, it was used a lot in the transition from no device tree to device tree because not all drivers had device tree bindings because they were in discussion. So a lot of uh, C code was being kept around and if the machine being booted was that one, then you would continue to register manually using C some platform devices that could not yet be described in the device tree. So it's progressively being less and less used on, on most platforms as we have more and more bindings, but it's still one possibility. So here we're, for example, matching um, that the machine is compatible with IMX28 EVK, which is going to be true because that platform is actually the one we're looking at. Does that make sense, this matching? So that's the way, um, yeah, matching with the, the, the uh, sub-architecture code is, is being made with the device tree. Um, inside the bus, so inside of each of those elements, uh, we're going to have a compatible string that defines uh, with what this bus is compatible, what entity in the kernel is going to handle that, that bus. If it's an I2C bus, then most likely the compatible string is going to identify an I2C controller driver. If it's an SPI bus, then most likely the compatible string is going to refer to an SPI controller driver. But there is a special value, simple bus, that's used to say, okay, that's just a memory mapped bus, and the driver, the kernel should actually go through the sub nodes of this bus and register each of them as platform devices. So many of the SOCs are using just a simple bus because they don't need any special bus handling. But some other SOCs, for example, including the Marvel one, they have a bus that has some crazy configuration possibilities. And so we have a special uh, compatible property and a special bus driver that goes through the sub nodes and does some funky things with them. So it's possible to have some specific bus driver. But most of the platform do simple bus, basically go through the sub nodes, register platform devices, easy. Uh, inside this um, bus, you're also going to have other properties, uh, the um, address cells and size cells. They are going to say in the reg property how many 32-bit values, because a cell is a 32-bit value, are going to be needed to encode addresses and size for the I.O. memory region. So if I take an example here, uh, this um, APB bus is a simple bus, so there's no special driver in the kernel except something that will register platform devices, and it needs one cell to encode addresses and one cell to encode size. And that's why we have only two cells here, because we have one cell for the address and one cell for the size. So there's a, a relation between how many values you put in, whoops, in the reg and those two informations. Um, there can also be a range property here which describes uh, address translations between the, the child bus and the parent bus. So if they are not in the same address space, uh, you can describe, okay, all the addresses here should be transformed uh, uh, according to some um, range, so some transformation. You can say, for example, from address X to Y in the child bus, it's in fact address A to B in the parent bus. Uh, so for most buses, you don't care about that because it's not necessarily useful. Uh, but some buses have funky things that require those translations. Some of the SOCs uh, use that to make the addresses here a little bit simpler. For example, if all your devices are their register within a specific area of memory, instead of encoding this base address over and over again in each device, you can just put a translation here that says, okay, uh, everything that's at, at A0000 are actually my devices. So whenever an address 0 is used in my child bus, I can translate that into address 8000 in the parent bus. So in the child nodes, instead of writing this, you could just write OX2000, and that would be translated automatically to OX8002000. So that's what we can do with ranges. When the property is empty like it is there, it just means it's identi um, it's, there is an identity mapping between the child bus and the parent bus. They are in the same address space, so there's no translation going on. And the reg property in, in the bus is uh, completely useless. Um, it's just here as an information of 
how like large is the address space covered by this bus, but it's, it's not used at all. And there are other platforms where it's, it's not available. It's not, it's not used because it's, well, just an information thing. Um, here is another example uh, with an I2C bus. So typically, this is the, the, the bus of the SOC. And one of the nodes that could be here could be an I2C controller. So what you see here is actually here, inside this node. So it's one of the sub-nodes of our SOC bus. So one of the devices on our SOC bus and there's an I2C controller. And um, so if it's, since it's a controller, it's a device like any other. So it has a compatible string, it has some registers to control it, there's some interrupts, maybe DMA channels, maybe other clocks and other informations. But this device being a controller, it drives a bus. And so it's, you need to describe the devices that sit on that bus because it's not a, a dynamically enumerable bus. And so it's, it's, since it's a bus, we're going to add again address cells, size cells. And in the I2C world, the, the binding that has been chosen is that the reg property of I2C devices is used to give the slave address of the device on the I2C bus. And that's the only information needed. So you don't need a size, uh, you just need one address. So address cells is one, size cells is zero. And as you can see in the child nodes, each of them describing one specific device on the I2C bus, the reg property is used to give the, the child, uh, the, sorry, the I2C slave address. So depending on where you are, reg means either the, mem the memory location of the device, or it might mean the I2C slave address, or it might mean the uh, chip select used on, on SPI, or it might mean completely something else. So the meaning of a given property can only be interpreted relatively to where it's located in, in the device tree and which binding applies to this specific node. Generally, they try to, make, to keep things that make sense. I believe that makes sense because reg is kind of where the thing is. So it makes sense to, to use that, but it can be a little bit confusing at times to have the same property name being used to actually give a, a different type of value. Um, and so for each of those uh, child nodes, we again have a compatible string that's going to identify the driver and then a bunch of other inf information that uh, are needed for this, uh, uh, the description of this specific piece of hardware. So here we have like uh, pointers to regulators that are needed by this uh, device. Here we have another property that probably gives, I don't know, page size of, of some I2C or, uh, or flash or whatever that are going to be used by the corresponding driver. So this is part so for this, we have one binding. For this, we have one binding. For this, we have one binding. So each device has its associated device tree binding, which is the specification giving the meaning of those properties. Interrupt handling is interesting. Uh, we have a number of properties related to interrupt handling. One of them is interrupt controller. It's just a Boolean property. If it's there, it means that the current node is an interrupt controller. It can um, uh, receive interrupts. Um, interrupt cells is a property that indicates the number of cells that are needed in uh, the interrupt field to encode uh, an interrupt number. Uh, sometimes it's just one, just an interrupt number. Sometimes it's more complicated, and I'm going to show an example. And we also have a proper property called interrupt parent, which is a p handle, so it's a pointer, which tells for this specific device uh, what um, is the interrupt controller that is receiving the interrupts generated by this device. So in addition to saying which interrupt number is being fired, you also need to say which interrupt controller is receiving this, because on some platforms you may have multiple interrupt controllers. And often there is a top-level interrupt parent definition for the main interrupt controller so that you don't have to repeat that over and over again in all the child, all the device nodes. So if you have like one main interrupt controller, um, you give interrupt parent at the top and it will consider that all devices are using that except if you explicitly override that with an interrupt parent uh, property in the device node. So to make that more um, realistic, uh, let's see an example. Again, IMX28. Um, so the interrupt controller is just one device like any other. So it's described in the, whoops, in the APBH bus as a device, compatible string, it has some registers, but it has also these two additional properties, which says I'm an interrupt controller, and to describe um, interrupts, so I, I will be late, but I guess it's lunch, so I can probably extend a little bit. It's very wise from the program committee to always put me before lunch breaks, because I always have like too many slides. 
Um, so the intro, this is saying we need one cell to encode interrupt numbers. And here, as we can see, we have one interrupt number, so we are, it's matching the fact that we need only one cell. And the reason why the kernel is going to understand that those interrupts are going to this interrupt controller is because we have this top-level interrupt parent. So this top-level interrupt parent property could have been here as well, and then duplicated in, in, in all the other devices, but just to make it shorter, it was moved uh, at the top of the device tree. Uh, because the logic of this binding is that whenever you don't find an intra parent property, you just go in the parent bus, and if it's not there in the parent bus, and then if it's not there in the parent bus, parent bus, and so on and so on, until you find what is the uh, intra parent for this bus. Let's look at a more complicated example. Um, that's a Tegra 20 platform, just picked a random one. So it has an I2C controller which triggers an interrupt to the main interrupt controller. It has a GPIO block which triggers interrupt to this um, interrupt controller. Uh, and it has a, um, on, on some specific board, so that's the, the blue part is the SOC and the gray part is the board. On the board you have um, an audio codec which sits on the I2C bus, so it's controlled there. And it also has an, a GPIO interrupt, uh, that, a GPIO line that's used for uh, signaling an interrupt. So it goes through the um, uh, GPIO controller here. And the, the code to do that is actually um, interesting. Um, and we're going to have a, have a look at that. So at the SOC level, what do we have? We have the interrupt controller, the I2C controller, and the GPIO controller. The interrupt controller is just a normal um, device like any other. It's marked as interrupt controller. But as you can see here, the, the number of cells is different. It's a, it's a geek, so it has a different way of expressing interrupts. I'm not going into the details, but instead of uh, recording only one information, it needs three informations. Uh, and, and that's something we can see here. So the I2C controller interrupts goes to the main interrupt controller because the interrupt parent here is pointing to this node using the p handle. And therefore, if it wants to describe an interrupt, it should have three cells, which it has here. And uh, as you can see, some of the values are not um, just numbers because nowadays most of the device tree um, inclusion is resolved using the C preprocessor. So we can use defines to replace magic values. It's something fairly recent, like maybe two or three kernel releases ago, something like that. Before that, we just had like magic numbers all over the place. Now we have this possibility of using macros, which is quite nice. And uh, we have another device here the GPIO block, and it's triggering a number of interrupts to the main interrupt controller. And if we look now at the board, um, the board level, uh, what the board level is going to do is for the I2C controller, it's just going to enable it, and it's going to describe which devices are on this I2C bus. So what we have on this I2C bus is an audio codec, which is here. We have a compatible string, the I2C slave address. And what's important in the discussion here is the um, interrupt uh, parent and interrupt property. So this, um, the interrupt that is triggered by um, this audio codec is not going to the main interrupt controller. So we are overriding the interrupt parent property saying the interrupt of this device is going to this other interrupt controller, which is actually the GPIO uh, bank. And this is possible because the GPIO bank is saying, hey, I'm an interrupt controller actually. And if you want to describe an interrupt that's pointing to me, you need two cells in the interrupts property. That's what we have here, interrupt cells. And that's actually exactly what it is doing. It's giving like one cell here and another cell. So it's basically giving which GPIO is used and whether it's like level triggered, edge tri trigger, that kind of additional information. So that's the way you can you read uh, things in the device tree. So I know it's quite weird at the beginning, um, understanding that, OK, this needs two cells because this interrupt is going to this interrupt controller, and this interrupt controller is saying that to express an interrupt that's pointing to me, we need two cells. But that's the way things are organized. Um, I have too many examples, but so another example is uh, clocks. So here is a very partial view of the clock tree on some Marvel SOCs. So we have core clocks, um, we have CPU clocks, and we have gateable clocks for the various devices. And therefore, you, if you want to handle that in the kernel, you have drivers for all those different clocks. Uh, some of them can be changed, some of them can be gated, or can change their rate, uh, whatever. And therefore, at the SOC level, uh, what we um, did is we created drivers for all of those clocks. So we have one driver for the, the core clocks here, 
Uh, we have one driver for uh, the CPU clocks, and then we have uh, one driver for the gateable clocks. So it's actually pointing to a bunch of registers that allow us to read the current rate, maybe uh, turn off the clock or turn it on or do manipulation of the clocks. And then we need to um, allow um, devices to reference those clocks. And so uh, here are a bunch of examples of devices that reference their clock. For example, a CPU uh, can reference a clock. So the, there is a, a, um, a proper a binding for clocks consumer uh, that's valid for all devices. Uh, you should use a clocks equal property and give one or several clocks that this device requires. So this, our, uh, each CPU is using a clock. And here we have a PNL and then an argument. And we're finding the same logic as before. This is pointing to CPU CLK. CPU CLK is here, and it's saying clock cells equal one. So whenever you want to specify a clock that's managed by this driver, you shouldn't just point to this node, but you should give an additional information. And this information is zero, and the binding defines what this zero or one or two means. And in our binding, it means which clock you're actually interested in. So maybe, I don't remember, uh, CPU clock zero is going to be that one, core clock two is going to be that one, gateable clock uh, 23 is going to be that one. So that's a way of encoding information in, in the device tree. Of course, that's just a choice of the binding. Uh, some other people do it differently, but that's, that's a, one of the possibility of representing uh, clocks. We have another example here. Uh, the timer is actually uh, using, uh, can use two different clocks, either a fixed reference clock or a clock provided by the, by the SOC. And we're using, just like DMAs, channels, we have this mechanism clock names, which gives a name to the first entry and another name to the second entry, so that in the driver code you can say, I want to get the uh, NBCLK clock or I want to get the fixed clock. And the driver doesn't know exactly which clock is that. It just knows that it has like two clocks that, and it knows their names, but it doesn't know exactly to which clock it's going to end up pointing to. Here we have another device. It's the USB controller, and it's pointing to a gateable clocks. And because this gateable clock driver also has clock cells equal one, when you make a clock specifier, uh, you need to pass an additional information. Uh, and here we also have the description of the clock tree uh, because those gateable clock and CPU clock, as you can see, they also by themselves have a clock reference to a core clock, core clock so that describing progressively the, the clock tree. So there is really, the, and that's why I tried to include um, um, like this kind of block diagram of the hardware next to the device tree description, is that there's really a one-to-one -one mapping between the two things. Um, the final example that I have is the pin control binding. Uh, so the pin control subsystem allows to manage pin maxing. And so whenever a, a device needs some pins to be configured in some way, uh, it needs to interact with the, 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 the pin control subsystem. And just like clocks have a common binding that's used in all devices in, uh, on the consumer side, uh, the pin control subsystem has a consumer binding that can be used by all devices. And this binding, to make it uh, short, basically consists in two properties, a pin control dash and a number, uh, so typically just zero, except you have some more complex case. And this is going to give a list of um, pin control configuration that you need for this device to operate properly. And then it has a pin control names property, which is a bit like clock names and DMA names. It's going to give um, names to each of the states because the pin control 0, pin control 1, pin control 2 allows you to give different states of the device. For example, when it's active or when it's idle or in suspend, you may want to max the pins in a different, different way to save power. Uh, so you can give different names to these different states. But in the general case, if you don't have uh, too, too crazy power management going on, uh, you can just have one pin control 0 property that gives a list of pin configuration and name that default. And without doing any change in your driver, whenever your device is going to be probed, it's part of the platform driver logic, it's going to notice, oh, there is a default uh, pin control configuration in there, and it's going to ask the pin control subsystem, please configure um, whatever pins that are described in those configuration in the proper state. And that's being done automatically. So that's the consumer side binding. And of course, there is a provider side binding. And the provider side binding, just like the clock provider bindings, 
are specific to each pin control driver. So that can be some confusing at times. Um, that's how um, pin control drivers, which actually control the configuration of pins, describe which configurations are available. And some drivers have decided to um, uh, give uh, just um, register and uh, basically values. So this, these informations are identifying one pin and in which state it should be configured. So it's kind of black magic values. Some other drivers have decided to make things a little bit more explicit by listing the name of the pins and the function they should be muxed in. But what's important is that uh, in both cases, there is an, a name given to this configuration. And that's the name you find here as the, using the p handles. And so what this is going to do, when this device is going to be probed, since that's the default state, it's going to ask the pin control subsystem to use this configuration. So the pin control driver is going to look at that one and max those pins uh, in this configuration. So again, that's really closely tied to the hardware and describing all the different maxing possibilities and allowing board files to say, okay, on this specific board, the way the MMC is wired is that way, or the way, I don't know, the UR is wired is that way. Um, so the final notes I have are more general information about the GT. So it's what, uh, the first thing is that it's really a hardware description language. So it should describe the hardware layout and how it works, but it's not there to describe the hardware, the, the configuration of the system. So for example, um, a very simple example I have is you can describe in the device tree whether a device supports DMA or not, because that's a property of the hardware. My device is DMA capable or it is not. But you cannot describe or you should not in the describe whether you want to use DMA or not. Because whether you want to use DMA or not is not the property of the hardware. It's just how you want the system to be configured. But it's not a, represent a, a representation of what the hardware is. And this is sometimes causing some issues because in the old world, we had those platform devices with platform data. And people are just creating the device tree binding by each member of the platform data field is going to be a property in the device tree. This is more or less true for some of the properties that are actually describing the hardware. But for, for some of the other properties, it's not necessarily uh, correct to turn it into a device tree property because it's not describing hardware, but just a choice on, on the, the usage of the hardware. And that's normally not part of the device tree. Uh, the big question being, um, where do you encode this information? And there isn't much of a generic answer to that question, unfortunately. That's the, one of the issues that people are facing when moving to, to device tree. So it's, it's really a pair, um, a case by case discussion on how to solve that particular problem of how to express a specific configuration. But normally the device tree is not here for exposing these uh, configuration decisions. Um, DT bindings as an ABI, um, I guess most of the crowd is reading LWN or if, you're, if you don't, you should. Um, so the device tree idea is that it's OS independent. So normally uh, other operating system than Linux should be able to use the device tree as a representation of the hardware, which also explains why configuration choices should not be part of the device tree. Uh, and the original idea is that uh, hardware manufacturers could like write a device tree, uh, flash it into a device, and then let the user install whatever operating system it wants and have it like discover what hardware is available. That's the theory. Um, then there is real life uh, going on. If you want this to actually work, it means that whenever you create a new binding, uh, one of those specifications, and you start um, uh, shipping products that use this binding, then you have to keep them around forever and keep the compatibility forever. Uh, or otherwise, some other product will no longer work with a more recent kernel version. And um, this is hard to achieve because um, the hardware, the way of describing the hardware is quite complicated. The number of hardware platform is very large. Uh, the number of those platforms is, is enormous and, and going on at a crazy, crazy rate. And there's not enough manpower to review all those bindings and take uh, good decisions in a timely fashion. Um, and, but until now, the, the, the position of the, the device tree, I would say gurus, was that it should be a stable API and that maybe someday the device tree files would be taken out of the kernel and, and, and really have the two things separated. But at the ARM mini-summit uh, yesterday, there was a discussion around that. Um, 
because the, the device tree bindings stability is really hard to achieve and it's, cause, it's slowing down the development quite significantly because you have to make the perfect choice from the first time. And that's not really the way I believe Linux has been developed over time. Usually like make a simple solution to solve the problem that you have right now and then later on when you have a better understanding of the problem, like how your hardware is working or you're seeing the new SOC line or the new devices, then you have a better view of what's going on. Then you can improve the solution to cover more cases and more cases and, and progressively iterate and make things better. But with device tree bindings, if you want stability, then you have to be right on the first time. And that's really hard and kind of breaking the idea that, well, let's solve the problem we have right now and, and make it better later. Um, so it's, 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 it's been hard. I mean, I've been involved in some device tree bindings discussions where you had to plan everything in advance, like how things are going to end up and how things are going to work, even though you don't really understand the hardware really well yet. Uh, so that's, that's complicated. And so the discussions, I, I'm not sure exactly what the conclusion was and what is being presented today at the Kennel Summit, but my um, feeling uh, is that uh, we've reached an inflection point where even the DT gurus are starting to realize that it may not be so easy to make it a stable ABI and that at least for some time we may have to relax the rules a little bit and let some, bind some non-stable bindings flow in and, and let people get better understanding of how it works and, and, and progressively get the, the most important bindings uh, in place. Uh, so probably the, the rules will change a little bit and, and no, it's no longer going to be a completely strict canal ABI. So if it's not strict, then it's not canal ABI at all. So I'm not sure what the final conclusion is going to be. Hopefully LWN is going to make a write-up about that after the canal summit. But that's, that's an area that's still yeah, in movement. Um, so some, some guidelines, some, at least two, two things I have in mind when writing uh, bindings. Um, this is, the deciding on the compatible string is important. It's really important to use a precise compatible string rather than a vague one. So what I'm mentioning is that a number of people are doing, okay, my um, device is being used like in the variant T3020 and T3030 of my, I don't know, SOC line, for example. So I'm going to call the compatible string foo T3XX because it covers 320 and 330. But then T30, uh, T340 comes out. And in fact, they change the way the, the hardware block works and it's no longer compatible. The, the programming model of the device is not the same. The registers have changed, the interrupts have changed, some things have changed and it's no longer compatible. So now you have a compatible string T3XX that no longer makes any sense because it, it, it doesn't uh, reflect what T340 is capable of. So what you should instead do is use T320 and potentially use for T320 and T330 if they are exactly compatible and they are the same IP block and they have absolutely no difference. Then you can just use the same compatible string that's precise on the device tree of both of those platforms. And then when T340 comes out, then you have maybe another driver or in the same driver, you have another compatible string and, and some specific handling that allows you to handle the differences. So that's one thing. And the other, I believe, recommendation I would have is to not encode too much hardware details in the device tree. Um, some people had the vision that the device tree should allow you to adapt the kernel to a new SOC without making any changes in the kernel code, which I believe is completely crazy because there's no way of knowing how the next SOC is going to be different from the previous ones. So instead, I believe that, but it's, it's something that it's more or less a philosophical problem, but. I believe that it's probably best to have most of the hardware differences being handled in, in hidden by the driver and then have different compatible strings to identify different variants of the same IP block, of the almost similar IP block between variants of your uh, SOC family. Uh, and the reason is that if you have too much hardware details in the device tree to try to make the driver more generic, uh, usually the genericity is in the wrong direction. So when you actually have the next hardware, uh, oh, oops. I didn't plan it properly and it doesn't work out properly. And the other reason is that it makes the binding more complex. And since normally binding are supposed to be stable, uh, the more properties you add into it, the harder it is to keep something stable. So keep the binding simple is, I believe, one of the way of making sure that you won't have to break them um, too many times. 
Uh, some future directions, um, more DT bindings for various uh, subsystems, uh, subsystems such as DRM or audio, uh, for example, are still lacking device-free bindings because they are pretty complex subsystem that um, uh, make various devices interact between each other. So that's still ongoing. Uh, a tool to validate device trees against bindings. As I was saying, the device tree compiler only makes uh, syntax checks like if you have property equal and then quotes and then a string and then make sure it's, it's syntactically correct. But if you, if you make a typo in the name of your property, it's not going to notice. If you make, a, I don't know, any other typo or wrong usage of a binding, it's not going to notice. So there's no type checking, there's no, no nothing. So in, in some way it's a little bit, well, strange because we had C in, in the past that was doing type checking and compile time checks and everything all nicely. Now we have a language that doesn't do that anymore, but okay, that's the way it is. And so there are some tools that are being discussed to actually, instead of writing um, like a document for the binding, something that would be uh, usable not only by humans, but also programs, and that would describe, okay, a binding expect this and that property uh, with these values and so on. And then a tool would allow to make validations on the device tree against the bindings and make sure you're not using a property that doesn't exist or a value that isn't possible and that kind of additional checks. So that's being discussed. And another thing that has been like being discussed for a long time is yeah, supposedly the device tree is a hundred representation, so it shouldn't be part of the kernel, but something outside. Um, but it's it's probably going to um, cause a huge number of compatibility issues like I don't know, how do you synchronize the release schedules of those two entities and if you use old device tree with a new kernel or the opposite, what's going to happen and so on. So it's all part of the stable API discussion. And yeah, I think things are moving in, in, in this, this area and people are realizing it may not be as simple as they, they thought it, it would be originally. Uh, some references, um, the slides of course will be available on the, on the, on the website, uh, but st the most important references is the uh, EPAPR document, but again as I, as I said it's pretty hard to get started with that document. There is the devicetree.org wiki that hasn't been updated in years probably, um, so it's not so useful. Um, and then you have the device tree documentation and the bindings in the kernel sources and, um, and the device tree mailing list. That's probably the best starting point to continue looking into that. Uh, I know I'm horribly late. Um, if there are questions before lunch, I'll be happy to take some of them. Yes, sir. Um, you can, uh, I think with DTC, I've never used that myself, but you can disassemble uh, a device tree. That is, you can take the binary representation and get more or less the, the textual representation. I think some of the information are, are kind of lost in, in, the, in the process, like maybe the, the la labels of the, uh, the, of the nodes are lost because they're, they're not useful at, at runtime. But you, you can disassemble a device tree. Maybe you can... I have this in my talk tomorrow. Okay, so I think that isn't... So yeah, you can you can you can do that. Plus, you lose the macros. Hmm? If you have a macro on your TTS. Yeah, of course, if you have a macro, it, it's it's lost. Like. Yeah. Another question, maybe. Yep. Um. Yeah, the device tree has a, a magic number at the start, and uh, when it's, uh, you're using the appended DTB uh, mechanism, it's, it's, this, it's looking at this magic number, and same thing if you're using a DT-capable uh, bootloader, uh, it's looking at this magic, which I don't remember what it is, uh, to, to find out whether it's a tags or a device tree blob. Yep. Please. Um, I don't know. Maybe. Um, so the question is: Is there any way of authenticating the, the device tree blob, like making sure it hasn't been corrupted? 
Um, I don't know. I have no idea whether there's a CRC or anything like that in the device tree blob. Maybe someone else can comment on that, but I, I don't know. Yep. Um, the device tree bindings have kind of posed a problem, as you pointed out, in terms of the, uh, the inflexibility of having a single one defined for a long period of time. Has there been any discussion of adding some sort of versioning capability to the device tree bindings? Well, you have some inherent versioning capabilities because you can change the compatible string. And uh, if the kernel is still capable of handling the old compatible string and, and understand it as it was before, and then understand a new compatible string and understand the, the, corres the binding that corresponds to this new compatible string, then you have some, some kind of versioning capabilities in here because you have like two compatible strings that identifies two different bindings. Uh, the issue is that, uh, at least I believe, the compatible string normally uh, tells which hardware you have. But normally for a given piece of hardware, you should have one compatible string, uh, regardless of whether the binding is evolving. But that's not something that has been like, really discussed, I believe. And there's, be beyond that, there's no versioning mechanism in place. I think there was some discussion at Linaro Connect about like, having some properties with a version of the binding, something like that. But it, it didn't went further than just like, random thoughts like that. So at the moment, uh, the, the, at the, moment the, the, the answer of the device tree people about that is just if the binding changes, well, first don't do it. But if it really needs to change, then the way to change it is you change the compatible string. And in your driver, you keep the code to handle both the old one and the new one, which ob obviously means a lot of crap code in, in all the drivers everywhere. But that's, that's something they don't seem to really care about. Uh, well, last question, I guess. Thank you. That's a good question. I have no idea whether there's a proc. Is there a proc entry with the FDT or something? Yeah? yeah? yeah. Answer from the audience, yes. I think it's a binary format that you get in. Uh, no, you get the. Uh, in, in the front, I'm being told it's a text version. Not sure how it's working exactly, but maybe it's just. I don't see how it can be disassembled. Oh, uh, yeah, okay. Yep. Let me make one comment. So the CE workgroup of the Linux Foundation is uh, intensely interested in fixing some of the problems, uh, particularly the lack of documentation. And so uh, hopefully we'll be able to announce some stuff shortly about uh, some more resources to help device tree authors. So. OK. So on that, I'm going to thank you and uh, wish you a good lunch late, certainly. But thank you for attention. <laughs>